Welcome to Prime News Lanka, Sri Lanka's premier news channel. Uh, hello. I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, congratulations to the National Science Foundation on, on the launch of this book. Uh, I think it's I've had a chance to uh, glance through its contents and it's uh, a truly impressive achievement bringing together uh, contributions from many diverse disciplines. And this is exactly what we need when confronting a major challenge uh, such as COVID-19. So my topic is reflections on a post-pandemic future. But <clears throat> before we reflect on the future, <clears throat> We need to see where we are and how we got here. And uh, this is uh, the global view of um, the situation with uh, COVID-19 at the moment. And, uh, and you can see that, um, uh, that with the, although there was an initial decline globally and also in the Southeast Asian region, there has been a resurgence of cases globally, including in the Asia, South Asian region. And this is primarily due to the new variant, which is the Delta variant. And this, of course, uh, played havoc uh, in India. And um, I'm afraid I have to say that it is going to have a major impact on Sri Lanka in the coming weeks. Um, I know this is a uh, this is a happy occasion, but I would, as a public, public health professional, I would be remiss in my duty if I do not warn that Sri Lanka is going to face the worst COVID outbreak that it has faced uh, in the months ahead. Uh, all congratulations to the uh, government uh, and Professor Jayasumana for pushing forward the vaccination campaign, which is going very well. However, as you know, you need two doses of vaccine to have a significant impact. And in the next one or two months, that is not going to protect us from the impact of the Delta variant. So I hope uh, the population is uh, well uh, advised of that. The other impacts, of course, of COVID-19, as was well described in this uh, in this book, are the economic impacts. You can see there the, the impact on emerging countries in Asia, excluding China, a huge impact on GDP, the impact on education, uh, the impact on the, the uh, mental health and society in general. And this has been certainly a global issue that all countries have had to deal with. So where did this come from? Uh, many of us or many people thought that pandemics like this were a thing of the past. However, if uh, we had paid attention, I think we would have seen that over the last 20, 30 years, there have been repeated episodes of major infectious diseases, many of them completely new whether it be the avian flu, SARS, uh, the H1N1 swine flu pandemic, uh, Ebola, uh, and most recently Zika. So I'm afraid it was not a surprise that we would have to face uh, a, a major epidemic again. And what are the factors that contribute to this? And these are indeed multidisciplinary. These are not just to deal with uh, uh, healthcare. So there is population growth, it's urbanization, very intensive travel across places and countries, um, intensive trade, the way we raise our livestock, the wildlife animal trade, uh, overall uh, uh, patterns of behavior, and uh, on the environment, ecological degradation and change, deforestation, climate change. So these are really very complex issues that are contributing to the emergence of these uh, epidemics and pandemics. And I'm afraid uh, these still continue to challenge us uh, unless we really take, uh, uh, pay attention and try to reduce and mitigate these risks. Uh, now, you might think that this pandemic was completely unexpected, but uh, that is not the case. I mean, uh, uh, for example, uh, Bill Gates, probably 
somebody that everybody knows, um, in 2015, uh, gave a TED talk where he warned very starkly of exactly what we would face. And um, one might think that coronaviruses uh, nobody heard about, but uh, again, it was beginning of 2019, I was taking part in a Keystone Symposium preparing for the next pandemic. Uh, and I was asked the question, what are the viruses that might cause the next pandemic? And I said, influenza and coronaviruses. So uh, unfortunately, uh, the scientific community has been very alert to this possibility. Uh, I gave you the examples of the previous epidemics, such as Ebola, which was, of course, terrible in West Africa, but luckily it didn't spread very rapidly, so the, the world didn't take too much notice. Or we had the swine flu in 2009. It spread very rapidly, but luckily it was a very mild pandemic. So again, we didn't take much notice, but we dodged bullets one after the other but this particular bullet hit and it is very painful. It was inevitable, there was plenty of warning, but the world, I'm afraid, failed to take heed and make the necessary investments and preparations to deal with it. Uh, now, after Ebola, indeed, there was some response. There were a number of global commissions, um, most notably the one from the US National Academy of Medicine, and uh, that was, in fact, headed by a banker, Peter Sands, and they made uh, quite a number of uh, recommendations. They, they predicted that the annualized eco economic loss from epidemics would be over 60 billion US dollars. And they suggested that an annual investment of four and a half billion to upgrade public health systems of low and middle income countries, enhancing the capacity of WHO, investment in research and development, particularly in, in vaccine uh, and antiviral development would be important. But unfortunately, uh, by the time action began to be taken on these issues, the pandemic had already hit us. But some of those measures that were taken did help in the development of vaccines for COVID-19, for example. Um, now, we have these very expensive toys, like what you see here, an aircraft carrier. The cost of building one of these is 13 billion US dollars. And that doesn't include the cost of running it. Uh, and of course, uh, countries, uh, say for example, the United States has many of these aircraft carriers, but it did not protect the United States from the ravages of this pandemic. So I think the issue is we are very well ready to, to put down huge amounts of money for things like defense. But as nations, we have not been willing to invest in global health security, which is, uh, which is equally or probably even more needed. So as I pointed out, many of these infections come to humans from animals. So we need to tackle this in an integrated manner. Uh, and what is called the One Health Approach, which is the collaborative efforts of multiple disciplines working locally, nationally, and globally to attain optimal health for people. Yes, people, but not just people, also animals and the environment. So people, animals, and the environment. So we really have to take a holistic view if we are going to tackle these challenges for the future. Another issue that really hit hard, hit home and hit hard, was the impact on global supply chains. So initially it was a loss of, uh, a shortage of masks, but then it was other things like ventilators and oxygen, et cetera. And uh, the whole global supply chain, as you know, last year and even up to now, is still uh, feeling the impact of the pandemic. And again, People might say, oh my gosh, we never thought of it. But again, uh, this is a book written by Michael Osterholm, somebody whom I know personally, who is now on the COVID task force for uh, President Biden. Uh, if you read this book, he very clearly laid out the impact of a pandemic on global supply chains. It's not just the health issues, but all the other implications that flow 
from uh, the, uh, the, the, the impact on disrupting our globalized trading and supply patterns. And of course, uh, the, the most, uh, the most uh, dramatic example right now is of course the vaccine inequity, which is undermining global economic recovery. And, and the UNDP has recently uh, estimated that low income countries would add 38 billion to their GDP for this year if they had the same vaccination rates as high income countries. And, and again, I think congratulations to Sri Lanka for, for rolling out uh, the vaccine campaign that it is doing now. Now, as this uh, book illustrates, dealing with a pandemic like this uh, is not just a matter of healthcare. It requires uh, understanding the social context. It requires leadership. It requires understanding the population's perception of threat, and it requires good communication. Taking all these together, understanding uh, threat perception and the social context. Uh, now, of course, uh, the pandemic is not going to go away. Uh, we heard the term virus variants already. Viruses replicate in living cells, and when they replicate, they acquire mutations. And uh, this is not a designed process, but it's the blind force of evolution, which will throw up a range of diverse virus variants. And of course, the viruses that are best suited to transmit become selected. And that's how these variants arise. So these variants are not selected for virulence or causing more severe disease. They are selected for transmissibility. This is why the, the alpha variant that hit Sri Lanka in uh, earlier this year uh, was more transmissible than the previous one, but the delta variant, which is currently in Sri Lanka, is even more transmissible than the alpha variant. So sequentially, the virus is becoming more and more transmissible. And I'm afraid these virus variants will continue to emerge. So SARS coronavirus is here to stay. Uh, but we need to learn to live with it, and certainly effective vaccines will be an important component in mitigating severe disease and death. But I think we have to understand that we still need to modify behavior in the new normal. But before I end, I, I want to also talk about things beyond pandemics, as I did indeed in my my uh, talk and my chapter in this book. Uh, pandemics are not the only thing we have to deal with um, because what we have at the moment at the planetary level is that uh, humankind is consuming the resources of this planet. In nature, nothing grows forever and human species also cannot grow forever. Uh, at least our consumption cannot grow in an uncontained, unsustainable fashion. And what, as humankind, what we are doing now risks rupturing the limits of planetary sustainability. And this is true in terms of climate. It is true in terms of um, the biodiversity loss, in terms of air pollution, and many other uh, factors that are essential to keep planet Earth to be a, habit, a habitable environment. And uh, I'm sure if you watched the news recently, you'd have heard about the floods in Europe, the fires in uh, Western Canada, uh, and the uh, other uh, challenges that uh, planet Earth has to face. So we really have to change uh, the way we do things. And COVID-19, I think, I think, um, uh, Professor Amaratunga mentioned that we need to see opportunities in difficulty. And if there's one opportunity in the difficulty of COVID-19, I think is to use it as a teaching opportunity for us to start acting against these other even more dire global challenges. So with that, let me summarize uh, the key messages. Uh, going back, to normal, I suggest we don't think about going back to the old normal. We think about going back to a new and better normal uh, in the context of some of the points I made 
in terms of planetary sustainability. Uh, be humble in the face of nature. I think uh, humankind seems to have got the impression that we can conquer the forces of nature, uh, but we are far from that. And COVID-19 has clearly shown us that. Keep uh, the warnings from science before it is too late. Uh, the value of a strong research base and a strong public health infrastructure, I think, is illustrated by the pandemic. The need for a multidisciplinary approach, indeed, that is what is illustrated in this book that is launched today. The need for effective communication, particularly to counter fake news on social media. Uh, and just to remember that COVID-19 is not the last pandemic. We need to learn from this event to pre prepare for the future, to mitigate risks and enhance the capacity to respond. And as I mentioned, it is not only pandemics. Uh, pandemics probably not the worst thing that uh, we face at the moment. The threats from climate change, environmental pollution, loss of biodiversity are even greater threats, uh, but more insidious threats than the pandemic, which we really have to counter. And uh, indeed, yesterday was the Earth Overshoot Day. Uh, what does that mean? It means that by yesterday of this year, we have used up our natural resource quota for the whole year. I don't mean Sri Lanka, I mean globally. Globally, we have used up the natural resource quota we can sustainably use already by the end of July. So from now on, we are running on, uh, on an unsustainable uh, uh, drain on planetary resources. So to, with that, I will end and I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Subscribe now and press the bell icon. Never miss an update.